Our lectionary uh, today is full of some great readings, and um, uh, one of them is, that I'm not necessarily preaching on, but I will talk about it a little bit, is a reading from Exodus this morning. And so I'm looking for Miss Jerry to come on up and, and, uh, and do our reading this morning from the book of Exodus, chapter 16. Thank you. Good morning. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the fifth, I'm sorry, on the sixth day, they are to prepare what they, are, what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, in the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, you will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evenings and all the bread you want in the morning because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, say to the entire Israelite community, come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening, quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. And when the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. Amen, thank you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Jerry. That, that was a long one, but, uh, but a good one. <laughs> The, the lectionary is, uh, is uh, this grouping of scriptures that's put together that takes us on a trip all the way from the Old Testament through the New Testament over a three-year period. And sometimes the, the, the scriptures kind of hang together and have, a, and have a theme, and sometimes they don't. But today they certainly do. They have a theme. And so we're reading about uh, the, the, the Jews following Moses and, and grumbling in the desert, and now we're going to have a reading from Matthew uh, chapter 20, if you want to follow along. It's Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. Hear these words from the Gospel of Matthew. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into the vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call all the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received his usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner. 
saying, These last worked only one hour, and you've made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me this morning. Lord God, we thank you that you are not fair. We thank you that your grace abounds for all in the kingdom of God. Lord, as we contemplate and open these scriptures today, we pray your guidance, we pray your Holy Spirit to speak to us and through us today. And Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I did not deserve to be treated like that. I got there first thing in the morning. I was ready to work a full day. My family has been waiting for me to find work, and I was there. And I worked hard all day long. I sweated out in that field, picking those grapes. I showed that boss that I was not a slacker. And then, all through the afternoon, these lousy good-for-nothings show up, work a half day, three hours, two hours, one hour, and he has the nerve to give them the same pay that he gave to me. I did not deserve to be treated like that. I did not deserve to be treated like that. My family has been waiting for me to find work for weeks, and I show up early, and no one hires me. And I have to face them at the end of the day with nothing to offer them. And then I'm standing there, and the day is almost done. And this manager comes up to me and says, come and work in my vineyard. And I think it's only, it's five o'clock. We've got an hour left. How can this be? But I go because I'm not going to turn down work. And I go and I work and I work hard. I want to show them that I'm not a slacker, that I want to work. And when the whistle blows and the time is up, he comes and he calls us all around and You know, I think, well, I'm going to get a few pennies for the hour that I worked, and that's fair. I was only there for an hour after all. But he calls me over first. The last one there worked an hour. I was a little embarrassed, I'm not going to lie. But I went up, and I held out my hand, and, and he put in a denarius, a whole day's wage. I don't deserve to be treated like that. See, that's the beauty of grace, is that it's not fair. (laughs) That's the beauty of grace, that grace is not fair. If it were, we would all be in deep, deep trouble. Amen? Grace is not fair, and that is a good thing. We need to thank God for that. Because I want to tell you this, as we're talking about this this morning, is that if you don't want grace to be grace, then you don't get grace. Let me say that again. If you won't let grace be grace, then you don't get grace. And what I mean by you don't get it is that you don't get it, and you don't get it, but you don't get it. You don't get to experience it if you don't understand that grace is not fair and let grace be grace. These two stories today, they just go hand in hand together about God's economy the way God works. You know, the word economy comes from the Greek meaning oikos nomos, which house rules, house laws. The economy of God, his house rules, are totally unfair. And praise God for that. The reading that uh, Jerry shared with us just a few minutes ago from Exodus 
in the desert. Moses leading his people out of bondage in slavery, leading his people from their captors in Egypt, where they were mistreated, where they were bound, where they were slaves. God, who literally swept aside an ocean to his, for his people to walk through to their freedom. God, who broke the chains in Egypt, parted the sea for them to cross, gave them a promised land, gave them a leader in Moses and in Aaron, and, and said, go to the promised land. I will lead you. And he did. He led them in a, in a pillar of cloud by day and a fire by night. He did all of this for them. He gave them manna to eat. He literally gave them frosted flakes from heaven that they found on the rocks in the morning. He let it hail quail on them so that they could have meat. And they were happy for about a minute. <laughs> and then when things weren't snapping, when that water wasn't flowing out of the rock to quench their thirst anymore, that they could see these big miracles, they immediately began to grumble. I want you to notice that the word grumbled, grumble, or grumbling is in that passage that Jerry read a total of seven times. Seven times. Grumbling, complaining. It's not fair. We want to go back to Egypt where at least we had meat to eat. It's not fair. Thank God it's not fair. Thank God it's not fair for those Israelites because God was ready to smite them at any turn. But Moses, the leader that God had appointed for them, interceded on their behalf several times to turn God's wrath away from them. The grumbling and the complaining, the back to Egypt committee. Remember, I've talked about that before. There's always a back to Egypt committee that says, you know what, things are a little tough right now, so we, let's just go back. Let's go back. We, yeah, we were in chains, but you know what, we had meat. It, was, it wasn't that bad. You know how we could always say that? Well, it really wasn't that bad. You know, we could do that about a lot of things in our life, situations that we knew we needed to get out of, but we want to go back somehow whether it's addictions, whether it's bad relationships, whether it's us in the church going back to a system that doesn't work. But we're going to go back because we know it. You know, it's that the devil you know is, is better to deal with than the devil that you don't know. There's always a back to Egypt committee. And then in this, in this Matthew text this morning, we, we hear the same kind of thing. We hear, we hear grumbling from people that don't want to see God's economy work the way God's economy wor wants to work. They don't want to see grace be grace, and so they don't get grace. I want to just tell you about the word grumble in Hebrew. In, in Hebrew, the word is loon, and it means two things. It means to lodge or to settle, and it also means to murmur or complain or grumble. So I, I think it's interesting that it has those two meanings because we have a choice of where we're going to lodge and where we're going to settle. You know, we're going we're gonna to either lodge and settle in, in Grumble Town, Complainville, where, where, where we're going to be miserable and we're going to make everybody miserable around us, or we're going to choose to lodge or live in God's grace. And that's the choice. God told us early on in, in Scripture that I set a choice before you, life or death, choose life. He told us that to choose life. And last time I was with you talking to you a couple weeks ago, I talked about abundant life. And I talked about the life that Jesus wants us to live, that life of abundance, that not the surviving life, not the getting by day-to-day -day life, but the life of thriving that is ours for the asking. And it's ours, and it's available. In, in the scripture today from Matthew, the landowner says to him at the end, says to the ones that are complaining, he says, take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to you the last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to choose with what belongs to me? To do what I choose with what belongs to me. And then this phrase, or are you envious because I am generous? 
And the word envious could mean, uh, back in the day, it was like an, ev an evil eye. Are you giving me the evil eye, he's saying, because I'm generous. In other words, are you cursing me? Are you putting a curse on me because I'm generous and I choose to give to the ones who came last the same I gave to you? You see, he only promised a fair wage. He promised the guys that came early, I will give you a denarius, which is a, day, a day's wage. So they were, that's what they were promised, that's what they got. Now the ones that came later, he said, I will give you a fair wage. They thought maybe, well, I'll, I'll get a couple bucks. But they also got a full day's wage. See, the beauty of grace is that it's not fair. They all got the same. And the ones that came early grumbled. How dare you make them equal to us? How dare you make them equal to us? We've been here all this time. There's a couple of interpretations about this scripture. Um, you know, some believe that it talks about the Gentiles coming into the kingdom of God late to the game. He's had his chosen people, and those were the ones that were supposed to be blessed. And then the Gentiles come along and late to the party, and he gives them all the grace that he gave to the Israelites. What's, what's that about? How dare he? I think, that's a, I think that's a fair interpretation. It can, mean, it can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. It can mean something to you sitting here this morning that it doesn't even mean to me, this story, because that's how Scripture is. It kind of opens up places in us that we never even knew about. Maybe you've been treated unfairly. Maybe things aren't working the way you think they should work. And maybe you start to think that that's God's fault. But I'm here to tell you today, it's not. God does not want you to suffer. God does not want you to, to be ill. God does not want you to have financial hardships. But God will allow those things to happen in this life because Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. God wants you to trust that he's walking with you through it like he walked through the wilderness with the Israelites. In the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. He was with them in it. All through their grumbling and complaining. The same is true for us today. He wants us to have life and have it abundant, but he also wants us to trust him in the valleys and in the deserts where we're not seeing it all happen right now. He wants our gra his grace to be evident in our lives, not just when the good things are happening and it's flowing like milk and honey, but when the bad things are happening and we exhibit grace to others. You know, there's a couple of ways to look at this story and, and the other stories in, in the Gospels about, about God as kind of an unfair guy. You see, we can look at it as the, as the laborers that started early in the morning, and, and we could kind of sympathize with them. I mean, let's be honest. If we worked all day long, and somebody showed up an hour before closing time, and they get the same wage as us, we can see ourselves very easily in that position and being angry. But I would hope that we would more see ourselves as the guys that came late to the party, that came an hour before closing time and worked for an hour and thought they were going to get a dollar, two dollars, and got a whole day's wages. I want us to feel that grace and that gratitude to God for his abundance. Because really, we get the same thing. We get God's grace. We get his abundant life, whether we started at 6 in the morning or we came at 5. We get the same thing. And if we're going to be the ones that grumble and complain about it, well, how sad for us that that's how we choose to live our lives. Withholding and, and, and judging that that one shouldn't get the same thing. You know, what it really is is envy. Are you envious of me, the landowner says, because I'm generous? And let me tell you the difference between envy and jealousy. 
See, jealousy says, boy, I sure wish I had that, that car that person has. We all experience that. We all covet a little bit. We're a little jealous. But envy says, I wish I had that car. And if I can't have that car, nobody can have that car. See, that's the difference between envy. That's the insidiousness of envy. That's why it made the top seven of those deadly sins, because that's what it does. It doesn't just say, boy, I wish I could have that. It says, boy, I wish I could have that. And if I can't have it, you can't have it either. And envy works in you like that. It eats you up, and it ruins friendships, and it ruins relationships. Are you envious of me because I'm generous, the landowner? God asks. Are we envious of God because of the way he treats others? Do we think that we are entitled to everything and that this one or that one or that one isn't? Grace is grace. And if we don't let grace be grace, then we don't get grace. There's a harvest out there, and it's funny that... Melanie picked this uh, bulletin for this week because it's real perfect. If you look on the front of it, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. See, there's a harvest, whether it's a vineyard or a wheat harvest. The parables of Jesus talked about the harvest being plentiful. And the world is harvesting people left and right. See, we're supposed to be gathering a harvest for the kingdom of God. We're supposed to be welcoming people into the kingdom of God and harvesting them. But the world is harvesting too. You see, the military is harvesting people. You know, uh, we need a few good men. You know, join the army now. Be all you can be. Schools, colleges are recruiting people and harvesting people. Uh, Employers are harvesting people. Gangs are harvesting people. Ask any of the police officers out there. Right, Beth? Gangs. Gangs are recruiting people and harvesting people all the time. People that are sad, people that are lonely, people that are experiencing trouble in their lives and not feeling like they belong anywhere or connect anywhere. The world is harvesting them up just as quick as you please. And the church needs to be doing that too. But we fail at that sometimes. We fail at that sometimes because I think we get too busy focusing inward and not outward. We get too busy grumbling and complaining about either what we have and we don't like it or what we don't have. Boy, if we only had this or that or this, we could, we could do everything. And we get caught up in that. And not only that, but we get caught up as Christians in not being very Christian out in the world. We're not a very good example in the world. We're wondering why in Europe Christianity is almost gone. And we wonder why in the United States Christianity is, is, is taking a huge hit. Churches are dwindling. People are not, are not going to church. They're not forming a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we wonder why, but I think this bears looking at deeply for all of us to see what we are doing in the harvest. Are we working diligently to harvest souls for Jesus Christ? Are we doing it in the way that Jesus Christ wants us to do? Are we bringing people in or are we turning people away? You know, I, I hear a lot about people wanting prayer in the schools and, and, and just complaining about, uh, about the kids today and how they don't respect and how there's just no uh, uh, respect for for authority and and you know I look out and I, I see people all over the place not respecting authority I, I see people talking in front of their children about the president of the United States now listen I'm not getting political on y'all I'm just saying that if you're going to talk about the president of the United States in such derogatory terms that I have to blush and, and, and close my ears What is that saying to your children? You don't have to agree with everything that the president says. I doubt that any one of us in here has agreed with any president and what they say. 
But when we do that, it, it just chips away a little bit of our authority. If, if they see us bashing the president and, and, and police officers or judges or whatever, left and right, why should they respect them? If, if you go in there and, and just raise it with their teacher because their teacher did something that you didn't like and you just tear that teacher up and down, why should they respect that teacher? We reap what we sow, and we are sowing some bad seeds here in the United States, in our churches. We are Christians. We are supposed to be a witness for Jesus Christ and for his grace. And so I want to challenge us today to, to, to maybe t work a little hard against grumbling. And I've just got three things that I want us to do to help us to prevent grumbling. You know, you can do it in your jobs to where you make yourself miserable every day. We can do it in the church. You can do it in your families. You can grumble and complain and see everything that's wrong with it. But here's some tips. The very first thing, and I heard this, and it just resonated with me. It makes so much sense. Number one is don't share an opinion where you don't share responsibility. Don't share an opinion where you don't share responsibility. We can all look at the job somebody else is doing and say, oh, wow, I would do this, I would do that, I would do this, that. Well, look, look, if you're not doing this, that, 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 then it's, shh, shh. <laughs> it's not helpful. I mean, I, you know, I can't tell you what to talk about. This is America. You are free. But if you want to have a healthy church, if you want to have a healthy workplace, if you want to have a healthy family, you will maybe at least think about these things. It's not helpful. Don't share an opinion where you don't share responsibility. Number two is stay in your lane. I thought about this as I was driving. I drove up to North Carolina and to go to a conference, and then while I was up there, I drove all around the Carolinas visiting family and friends. And man, when you drive around those mountain curves, whoo, it's pretty scary. Here in Florida, everything is flat and straight, but you get up on those mountain roads, and if you get out of your lane just a little bit going around one of those curves, it's disaster. It's disaster. So, so when we're going around a curve in our lives and, and things are changing and whatever, we got to stay in our lane. And what I mean by that is if it's not your responsibility, stay in your lane. You've got enough to do with whatever it is you're doing, whether it's a ministry here or whether it, you know, it's your job at work. Stay in your lane. <laughs> mind mind the, the double ye uh, yellow lines. And listen, the only time to not stay in your lane is if somebody's in the breakdown lane, okay? If somebody's over there, they're broken down, you, they need help. They're, you know, their engine's on fire. Get out of your lane and help them. But for the most part, stay in your lane. Don't drift, especially when we're going around curves because it gets dangerous. We learned from Nehemiah. Remember the story of Nehemiah we, we learned about in the story? How they worked on the walls around Jerusalem and they got, them done in they got it done in 52 days because every single family just worked on their part of the wall that was in front of their house. Just fixing that part of the wall. Let's everybody work together and side by side by side. Every family worked on their section of the wall and they got it done in 52 days. They stayed in their lane. And the last thing is this. I'm going to say it. This was a line supposedly said by Lee Iacocca. It was also possibly said by George S. Patton. But the, the words are these, lead, follow, or get out of the way. And I know that sounds harsh. But if you really think about it, it kind of fits into the kingdom message of Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus said, listen, follow me. Follow me. And, and to some, he said, lead people to me. Lead people to me. I want you to be a, a leader. I want you to be a disciple and lead people to me. And if you can't, if you're not doing either one of those things, then just step aside. Step aside and let somebody else do it. And don't sit there on the sidelines and tell them how it should be done or how you would do it. Just step aside. If this is not your time to either lead or follow, then just step Step out of the way. Sometimes what we need to do is step out of our own way. I make the mistake as much as anybody that sometimes I just need to get out of my own way, let the Holy Spirit work, 
and he can do amazing things. Beth had a great devotion at RT yesterday, and Beth, it's bright pink, I can't miss it, but she talked about Hawaii and how Hawaii has a law on their books called the Aloha Law, and that everyone is supposed to follow this law. That means to be kind and to promote unity and pleasantness and humility and patience and perseverance. That these characters and traits are required of everybody in every government position and every, every job in Hawaii. That this law is on the books. Is it literally still on the books that we know of? That's what we know. It doesn't exist at the airport in Hawaii. <laughs> well, somebody needs to be arrested. But that Aloha law, Beth, uh, proposed is that also should be our law as well, that the Holy Spirit should be directing everything that we do. And in that way, we should be holy, set apart by God. We should be Christ-like. We should be loving to our neighbors and ourselves and to God above all else, that we should be loving as much as God loves us. And we just, we sang that song, God, how he loves us. He does. He gave his only son for each and every one of us not just us sitting in these pews, but all those people out there in the world. He died for them as well. And so the things that are wrong with this world, we, well, we need to change them. But grumbling and complaining about it, that's not the way to do it. The word in Hebrew that means to give is natan, N-A-T-A-N. And it's a palindrome. It's one of those words that's the same backwards and forwards. So think about that. To give. To give grace. It's, it's the same backwards and forwards. When we give grace, we receive grace. When we receive grace, we give grace. That's how it's supposed to work. It's supposed to be an open channel like that. But let's avoid the hazards of the Hebrew people and the hazards of the laborers in the vineyard. And let's not begrudge other people God's grace. Let's not grumble and complain our way into the desert for 40 more years. They could have got out a lot sooner if they'd cooperated. I think we need to take that lesson and remember that today. Natan, to give, to give grace. If you can't let grace be grace, you don't get grace. And we all want grace. We want to get it. Amen? Let's pray. Lord God, thank you that you are such a gracious God, that you give so abundantly to each and every one of us, Lord. Help us to not grumble. Help us to not begrudge those who need the grace that you have to offer as well, Lord. Whether it's someone from another country, whether it's someone that looks different than us, maybe it's someone that holds a different political view than us, Lord God. Let us remember your grace is sufficient for all and that if we can be examples of your grace out in this world, we would not be able to keep the doors closed to this place. Every church would be filled to capacity if we did the things that you call us to do and if we were the people that you called us to be. Lord, you called us to soar like eagles. Help us to remember that. Give us the grace to be graceful. In your precious name we pray. Amen. I want to ask some special prayers today for our friend Pat Barrows. Um, we're going to pray over lots of folks today, but I spoke to Pat, and she's just really having such a rough time. And... Um, she has to go see a neurologist now, and they, they think it's something with water on her, on her brain, causing a lot of issues. Um, so please pray for Pat. Pat is one of the newcomers here to this church, and, uh, and she's just got such a heart for God and for other people. She prays for people, even while she's going through her, her trials right now. She's praying for you. She told me that yesterday when I talked. She's praying for each and every one of you. So please keep Pat lifted up in your prayers. Uh, today especially and let's pray for all those who need healing today lord we pray for our leaders we pray for our country lord we pray that uh, that we can be the shining star that we used to be that we can be a people that exhibit grace and that live the truth lord we pray for our country 
We pray for all of the things that are going on in the world and the violence, Lord, that you would just speak your peace into that violence, that you would turn hearts and minds towards you and the peace that you desire in your kingdom. Lord, we know you desire healing and wellness, Lord, so we pray today. We pray for Larry and Gabe. We pray especially for Pat this morning. We pray for Sylvia this morning and for Dawn and Jerome. We pray for Jack and Brenda, for Pat. We pray for Bill and for Roz. We pray for Lene. We pray for Clegg and Jeannie's grandson, Hudson. We pray for Shirley and for Paul. We pray for Bud and for Marie. We pray for Brenda this morning, Lord, and we lift up Julie and Jeff and Carol. We lift up Ricky and Ann, Bob and Deborah to you, Lord, this morning. We lift up Beverly and Jessup, Paige and Mary Ann and Gage today, Lord God. Lord, we lift up Etta and Lucy. We lift up Ida and David and James to you, Father God, and we lift up Matt. We lift up Tom and Diane, Lord, and we ask for healing and we ask for wholeness there and we ask for Diane's mom to have peace. We pray for Vernice this morning, Lord, and ask for you to make her well, that she can be back among us soon. And we pray for David and we pray for Robert this morning. Lord God, for all those in our hearts that we hold this morning, whose names we did not speak, but who you know and who you want to heal and have abundant life, Lord. We ask your healing touch and your presence be felt in each and every household that needs to feel it this morning, Lord God. Help us to pray for those that need prayer when they can't pray for themselves. Help us to be the grace that they need to have and to see and to feel when they can't see it or have it or feel it themselves, Lord God. And we pray as your children, with courage, and as your children say the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive others who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. 